So what do we know about gases? Well, we talked about gases in the beginning as, um, as a different phase of matter that has no volume of its own. It has no shape of its own. And the reason for that is that the particles that are in a gas act independently. In other words, they don't, they don't work together to say, uh, form a definite shape or a definite volume. There's still lots up, but they're very far apart relative to their sizes. And they behave uh, independently for ideal gases. We'll define what an ideal gas is later. Um, but their interactions are mild by comparison to liquids and solids. Okay. The particles inside a gas um, are, they could be atoms or they could be molecules. Um, hydrogen, H2, is a molecule, but it's still an element and it is a gas <clears throat> and these particles are moving very fast we're going to do the calculation a little later to show that these particles um, at least for the air are moving faster than the speed of sound gases are all miscible that's an that's an old an archaic term miscible it just means that they they mix they make a homogeneous mixture. Anytime you put two or more gases together, you get a solution. And that's primarily because they don't interact very much. Plus, there's lots of room in there. The distance between the particles is very far apart. So there's plenty of room for everybody. But these particles do, in fact, possess, have a mass. Each particle has a mass. So if they have a mass, and they're moving, each one has kinetic energy. So we need, to, we're also in our discussion of gases, we're gonna talk about how you get a handle on what that kinetic energy is, a way to represent the kinetic energy of the gases, the particles within the gas. Let me see, I'm gonna get my, my remote out, see if it help any. I don't know if it will or not. So I'm gonna have to keep stepping up to the computer. Just gotta find a plug in for it here. It working? No, it's not working. That part's working. Cursor's not working, but that's fine. That's all I need. <clears throat> um, we're also going to define some gas laws. In other words, how do gases behave um, in terms of their uh, defining parameters? And remember, a law just says what happens. Um, we'll talk about a theory after we discuss the laws to explain why those things happen. When we, when we talk about gases, we can define the physical condition and the behavior of a gas with, using four values, four variables. We need to know the temperature of the gas, we need to know its pressure, we need to know its volume, and we need to know how much of it there is. N stands for number of moles. If we know those four, we can, completely describe a gas independent of the chemical nature of the gas, I might add. Let's see. There we go. We're also going to define what is ideal gas behavior. And then we'll talk about um, how to use the gas laws to solve problems. <clears throat> 
just as an aside, the Earth's atmosphere, of course, is composed of gases and it's primarily nitrogen and oxygen <coughs> with a little bit of argon and some other trace um, compounds and elements mixed in. The Earth's atmosphere, these gases are necessary for life. Um, it's obvious that oxygen in the atmosphere is necessary for us. Without oxygen, of course, we suffocate. What we don't realize is that there's the other gas, the major gas, nitrogen, this is about 20, about 20%. 20 this is about 79%. The other gas, nitrogen, is essential for plants, primarily uh, green plants. But they don't have the ability to take that nitrogen and put it in a form that they can use. So there are many plants and actually free living microorganisms that will take nitrogen from the atmosphere and do what we call fix it, change it into a form that can be used. And they'll, they'll end up changing it into sometimes ammonia or ammonium, as the case may be, or nitrates. And then the plants, the green plants, can use it. They make uh, DNA out of it. They make enzymes, proteins, lots of different things. But nitrogen is absolutely essential for life on Earth. <clears throat> there are concerns about various types of pollutants that may exist in our atmosphere. And I'm not arguing that there aren't some. Uh, there are gaseous pollutants and there are particulates that are in the atmosphere that are suspended. Um, the issue I have is with agents, government agencies like the EPA trying to classify carbon dioxide as a pollutant. It's anything but a pollutant. Carbon dioxide is plant food. Plants don't live without carbon dioxide. And the more carbon dioxide you have in the atmosphere, the better that plants like it. Um, numerous uh, experiments in greenhouses and growth chambers, even in the field, have shown that increasing carbon dioxide concentration in the, in the atmosphere around the plant increases its productivity. So we'll not say any more about pollutants. There are some, uh, but we'll leave that for another discussion. Now, how do we define pressure, this particular parameter? Pressure is defined as a force per unit area. Oops, wrong direction. So we could write it this way, as a force per unit area. And numerous units can be assigned to this. Um, if we use the SI system, right? what's well, a force? Force is Newton. And area is a derived unit from the fundamental unit of a meter. So it would be meters squared. So newtons per meter square is a pressure. But the SI system also gives that another name. This is equal to a Pascal, abbreviated P. <clears throat> But uh, just defining what pressure is isn't good enough. We need some way to measure it. And it, it wasn't until the middle of the 17th century that a reliable, reproducible, calibrated way of measuring pressure was invented by Torricelli, Evangelista Torricelli. He was obviously Italian. <clears throat> And he, embedded, he invented what he called the barometer. And it's, there's a, the beginnings of the, um, uh, the arrangement of the barometer 
but it's essentially a long straight tube closed at one end. And the way uh, Torricelli made his barometer, uh, at this time, glass blowers were very good at making uniform diameter long tubes of glass. So all I had to do was close it off at one end, and then um, Torricelli needed some type of medium that would respond to pressure, uh, in particular, air pressure. And um, I'm sure he thought of different types of liquids that could be put in this device and respond to pressure. Uh, if he considered water, uh, he soon set that one aside because um, the density of water is only one gram per cubic centimeter. And if you want to make a barometer out of it, you need a tube that's 33 feet long or more. So he wanted something denser. And the, the densest liquid we have in pure form, and they had lots of it in his day, was mercury. So he filled the tube with mercury, and filled it all the way up to the top. And then he put his thumb over the end of it, inverted it, and submerged his thumb in a bowl of mercury. <laughs> They didn't know much about mercury poisoning back then. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, mercury metal is not particularly hazardous. I mean, you can you can shake it off your hands easily. And the problem arises under two conditions. If mercury is vaporized, and it has a very low vapor pressure compared to other metals. Um, if, it, if you get mercury atoms in the atmosphere and breathe them in, then they stay there, and that's when they can do damage. Uh, the other is uh, requires microbial action, converting mercury in the environment into organic forms of mercury. Uh, dimethyl mercury is extremely toxic. Just a tiny amount will kill you. And it won't happen quickly either. It'll destroy your nervous system. Um, we don't have time to talk about that right now. Anyway, so uh, Torricelli took this tube, inverted it in uh, a bowl of mercury, like that, and then notice what happened. What happened was the level of mercury inside the tube dropped. So in creating this barometer, Torricelli inadvertently created a vacuum. Right? A vacuum, by definition, is an enclosed space or a defined space that uh, once had matter in it, and now it doesn't. So that space had mercury in it, now it doesn't have any mercury. So he reasons that the height of the column of mercury was being supported by pressure from above bearing down on that bowl of mercury and pushing hard enough to hold that column of mercury up. And he noticed over time that if he'd left the, his barometer sitting on the desk, that the level would change. And he associated that with weather. Bad weather, the level would drop. Good weather, the level would rise. And that's still true today, low pressure versus high pressure, air pressure. So all he had to do was, in the vat, this is closed now. Had mercury in it. If the mercury rose to that level, all he had to do was measure the distance between here and there. And that was a measure of air pressure. And it comes out to millimeters of mercury and uh, one standard atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. Um, by the way, one atmosphere is a valid way to measure air pressure. So it's, it's defined as the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level on average.
So we had to agree upon what that would be. Okay. <clears throat> so these are the things that can happen to the, the uh, mercury column inside the barometer in response to air pressure. We can also use modifications of this barometer to measure pressure of confined gases. We call that a manometer. So if we enclose, if we completely close off this part and put a tube in it, like that, into a, so we've got a confined gas in here that's pushing out there. As it pushes, if we put more gas in there, it maybe it'll push harder and it'll make this go up. So this is a manometer. And if you've ever had your blood pressure checked with the old style um, device, uh, usually hanging on the wall, it has a column of mercury. In it. And that's called a sphygmo manometer because instead of this confined gas, it has a cuff that wraps around your arm and measures the, the push of your blood pressure as it goes up and down with the beating of your heart. And that's also measured by this device. So when the doctor tells you your blood pressure is, um, I don't know, 120 over 80, that's the high pressure is 120, 120 millimeters of mercury. And the low pressure is 80 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the, um, uh, I was trying to think of the terms that were used. Um, in my, my mind's gone blank. So this is not a biology course anyway, so we'll move on. Okay. So one other thing that um, Torricelli noticed, and other scientists as well, is if they put the if they put this barometer in their ox cart and carried it up to the top of a mountain, they noticed that the pressure air pressure went down on the same day over a short period of time. So the logic was that as you go higher, there's less air bearing down on your barometer, and it and it uh, registers a lower pressure. Come on, there we go. So normal atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Um, if we go in, up in altitude, uh, around here it's like seven, between seven and 800 uh, feet above sea level. So the air pressure would expect to be a little bit lower, but uh, where I live in Beckley, we're at about 2,450 feet above sea level, you know, almost half a mile. So the air pressure up there is much, much lower um, than you would expect. Okay. So there, for example, at the Raleigh County Airport, on one day, we measured the pressure at 694 millimeters of mercury. That's a lot less than 760. We can, we can uh, use dimensional analysis and convert these units. Among them, all we have to know is what are they equal to? Right? One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. Right? So we have an equivalence, that means we automatically have a conversion factor. But you can measure this in other ways. This can also be equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. Yeah. So this is how we would convert to millimeters, from millimeters to atmospheres. Okay, less than one atmosphere in Beckley. If you go up even higher to the ski resort nearby, you find out that um, the air pressure is much lower. Okay. 
okay? If you go to, say, Death Valley or the Dead Sea, you're below sea level. There's more atmosphere above you, so the air pressure should be higher. And we can convert that to millimeters of mercury. Right? That's greater than 760. Other ways to represent air pressure, the Pascal right, equals one Newton per square meter by definition. 29.92 inches of mercury is also one atmosphere. 14.69 pounds per square inch. We often say PSI or pounds per square inch, same thing. Uh, sometimes we use other types of measurement. One bar is equal to one atmosphere. And in Pascals, that's equal to 101,325 Pascals. Are you done? Okay. All right. Let's see, there was another one. Yes, millibar. Um, you know what? That's not right. This, yes, this is equal to 101,325. Pascals, one bar, but that's not equal to an atmosphere. That's a separate equivalence. One atmosphere is equal to 1013. No, 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 that's right. No, that is right. I'm sorry, that's right. That is equal to one atmosphere. And uh, a millibar is a thousandth of a bar, right? So you just take it one, two, three, a hundred and let's see. Uh, no, we have to go the other way. Um, a thousand thirteen millibars is equal to an atmosphere. The only reason we put millibar in there is because it's standard weather practice. When you read weather maps, you, it'll be listed in millibars. <clears throat> and we can convert we can convert these units sometimes we need um, a chained conversion right just chain them together and you can go from one of these to any one of the others inches of mercury we don't use too often anymore Okay, uh, let's see. Those are examples of conversions. Oh, <laughs> you might need a, one of these. <laughs> That's a review document. And here are your slides. Okay. And this is the lab we're going to do next week. Let me show the peanut gallery. We'll digress for a moment. This is a lab we're going to do next week, Boyle's Law. And I'll describe what Boyle's Law is in just a few minutes. So that's a formal report. So you need to prepare your lab notebook to uh, record that information. All right, let's get back to the discussion here. So we're still on pressure. Um, this slide is probably overkill. Just determine the exerted pressure of a mercury column 760 millimeters high by 5 millimeter diameter. And we need to know the density of mercury. Um, 
we need to know the acceleration of gravity, <laughs> strangely enough. <clears throat> and we can calculate the volume of that cylinder. We just need to know uh, the diameter of the cylinder, which is five millimeters. We can calculate the area times the height. That gives us the volume of the cylinder. And then we can use the density uh, equivalents to determine the mass. And then we take the mass of the mercury and convert it into a force in the gravitational field of the Earth. And if you've had physics, you know that the, uh, uh, let's see, force equals mass times acceleration. But in, in the gravitational field, we say the, uh, uh, the weight equals mass times g, acceleration of gravity. So that's all buried in, in that calculation. And it turns out that um, in that calculation, we've used this to determine the force, but then we needed to know the area. And the area, of course, is um, uh, five millimeters in terms of meters and then squared. So all that work told us that um, 760 millimeters of mercury, or one atmosphere, is equal to 101.3 kilopascals, which is just, move the decimal place here, three over, and that's kilopascals. Okay, now let's talk about the gas laws. <clears throat> that previous discussion was kind of boring. Let's get some history. Robert Boyle was an Englishman. And what we'll, what we'll come to realize pretty quickly is that the investigation of gases was the best route to go for quantitative investigations. Uh, simply because uh, gases were very well behaved. And you could treat every gas like any other gas. It didn't matter what it was made of. They all behave the same way. And um, the, those, these parameters that are investigated for a gas are dependent largely upon the technology. We had a fairly easy way to determine volume. And now with Torricelli's barometer, we could determine pressure. And those came first. So Robert Boyle took pressure and volume and said, okay, what if I increase the pressure on a confined gas? What happens to its volume? And what he did was he took a modification of the barometer. In other words, he took that straight tube and he bent it. Into a J-tube. The J-tube is filled with air. And all he had to do was add mercury to it. And the mercury started pooling up in the bottom here like this. And that fast. You just kept adding mercury until it touched the inner wall. And when it did, all the gas in that part of the tube was sealed. It was confined now. Okay. So he just kept adding mercury over here. Well, what happened on the other side? Well, mercury went up here, but not quite as much as on that side. And he measured the, dis the difference between the two levels here as the pressure in terms of millimeters of mercury on that confined gas. Um, okay, so as he added more mercury, and this, the difference between the larger and larger, this still moved up some, but not enough. He reasoned that the gas was pushing back. And he uh, charted it like pressure versus volume, right? And he got different values for the pressure and the volume. As the pressure went up, the volume went down. And he proposed that, uh, and he actually found out that if you multiply the pressure times the volume, he got a constant. That's Boyle's law.
Now, one thing that he had to be certain of was that he recognized that these four variables were could be applied to a gas. He had to be sure that he had the same number of moles every time, which was guaranteed because he trapped the gas in here. And he had to maintain the temperature. And these experiments don't take very long, so the temperature's not going to change that much. Or if, if you're really desperate, you could submerge the whole thing in ice water and you guaranteed that it's not going to change. <clears throat> But this is a, a modern representation of what happened. Uh, we have a graph there with the, um, actually that graph is turned the wrong direction because he changed the pressure. That's the independent variable. It should be on the x-axis. But I haven't got around to changing it. <laughs> so, if we experiment one says the pressure is 25 atmospheres, then you have a volume of four liters. Multiply them together, you get 100. And plot that on your graph. Okay. Then if we let the pressure go down some, the volume increases. But the pressure times volume is still 100. And we just keep doing that. Decrease the pressure. See, we're going backwards from the way he did it. <clears throat> and plot that out and pretty soon you realize that you've got a curve and that curve right if we plotted it correctly pressure and volume that curve would be like that and that's a particular type of of mathematical expression called a hyperbola you'll notice that if you remember uh, plotting hyperbola in math class, this, no matter how far you go up here, will never touch the axis. It just keeps getting closer and closer and closer. It never touches. And if you look at the equation, that makes sense. Because if one of these ever becomes zero, then it completely falls apart. Then it can't be 100 anymore. Right? So. As big as this one gets, that one can get smaller, but it can never be zero. And notice that there's also an inverse proportionality. As pressure goes up, volume goes down. Okay, and that's characteristic of a product equaling a constant. If you have two variables equal to a constant, if one of them goes up, the other one has to go down. Otherwise, that can't be constant. Okay. So, um, how do we use these to solve problems? Let's see. Okay, there you go. Let me erase some of this stuff so I have room to write. For any one of those experiments, we can say pressure times volume equals a constant. But you'll also can see from the from the data that a second experiment is also equal to that constant. So if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. We can just cut out the middleman. This is one condition. This is the next condition. If you know three of these, you can solve for the fourth one. This is what I call before and after situation. If you read a word problem that's asking you a question, and it gives you before and after conditions, then you know this is the type of, of solution for the problem. Okay, and you can arrange that equation any way you want to. <clears throat> uh, well, in the slide, we've got I and F, initial versus final. But same idea. Okay, here's an example. Um, calculate the final volume of a gas when 15 liters of the gas at 500 millimeters of mercury, 15 liters at 500 millimeters of mercury, uh, is the, where the pressure is dropped 
to 125 millimeters of mercury. So the after pressure is 125 millimeters of mercury. Oops. Well, I wrote K in there. It's a V. Then we can solve for this one. We just say that one times that one divided by this one. There's your volume. So you can do it by rearranging the equation and then substituting. What I do when I encounter a problem like this, I set up a table, right? Initial, initial, final, final. And I say, what are the values that go in those places? Then I know that when I plug them in the equation, they're in the right place. Because if you put them in the wrong place, you're going to get the wrong answer. Okay, so as it turns out, now the gas occupies 60 liters instead of 15 liters because we decreased the pressure. <clears throat> um, and you can use any units you want, right? As long as the temperature and the moles are constant, then the pressure and the volume can be expressed any way you want, uh, and the answer will come out in one of those units. Okay, this is just another example, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because it's fairly simple. Next, a Frenchman by the name of Charles, that was his last name, came along in, let's see, it doesn't say. Oh, there it is. Came along in the late 1800s. So it's about a century later. Actually, the work that Charles did, he never published. But um, scientists in those days were commonly communicating with one another, uh, either in Latin for a while, and then they switched over to French. Um, and then late, even later, they switched to German. Anyway. Um, in his communication with other scientists, he told them what the work he was doing and the results he had obtained. And one of those scientists was Joseph Louis Gay-Lussac. And he took uh, Charles' work and did some more work and published it and gave Charles credit for the, that part of the work. And for that reason, uh, it was dubbed Charles' Law. But Charles Law said that if you, if you hold the moles constant and you hold the pressure constant and let these two vary, what happens? So you're going to control the temperature and you're going to watch what it does to the volume. Now, why did this come along when it did? Because up to this time, they didn't have a reliable way of measuring the temperature. The thermometer had not been invented until about that time. Um, <clears throat> so technology allows them now to do experiments on. Now, they had ways of, of estimating the temperature, but there was no calibrated, reliable, and reproducible way to measure it until the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scales came along. So this is what Charles did. Well, he needed a, a way to um, keep the pressure constant. The number of moles was easy. You just trap the gas and don't let any in or out. So if you take a, a cylinder of a uniform diameter and you put a piston in it, and then you uh, maybe put a mass on top of it, say a kilogram, Now you've got a constant pressure and you've got constant moles. Now you can change the temperature. Right? Just put it in some type of container and you change the, uh, excuse me, change the temperature and measure the temperature. You have your thermometer here. And you measure the temperature of whatever it is you surround the gas. So that's your temperature. And then you watch the position of your piston and that will tell you the volume. So that's what Charles did. This one's set up right. 
he, he changed the temperature and watched the volume move. And when he, when he did that, he found that plotting the temperature against volume gave him a straight line. Okay, you can graph those results and you get that straight line. Uh, notice that the line only goes from here to here. It doesn't say what happens when the temperature's out here or, or up here. That would be extrapolation. Well, there were those who were interested in extrapolating. <laughs> so they, they took results. One of them was Lord Kelvin. And he extrapolated down. He wanted to know, uh, based on some other research that he had done, what happens, where would the temperature have to be? if the volume of your gas were zero. Now, we know that's never going to happen because gas has, the molecules have volume. But hypothetically, if you extend that line on down, it meets the x-axis where the y-axis is zero at minus 273 degrees. Celsius. Well, Kelvin decided that he was going to invent a new uh, system, a new unit. Well, he made the unit exactly the same size as the Celsius degree, only he moved the zero point from the from the, the freezing point of water. He moved it down to absolute zero. So on Kelvin scale, absolute zero starts at minus two seventy three C, and then Every degree above that is it's always positive. You don't have any negatives. And that's good because when you start doing calculations with temperatures and gases, if you have any negative numbers, it just completely blows up the formula. It doesn't work. You need a positive value for temperature. That's why anytime we do calculations with gases, um, we convert to Kelvin simply because they're always positive. Okay, so that was the result. And there's some decimals there, but we use 273, that's good enough. Minus 273 or, or Celsius plus 273, it gives you Kelvin. Okay, so Charles' law can be expressed similarly to the, um, Let's see, uh, volume divided by temperature equals a constant. So the um, whenever you see a uh, quotient, not a product, but a quotient equal to a constant, you know it's a, a direct relationship because as one goes up, the other one has to go up to be constant. And we can also solve problems this way. for the same reasons as Boyle's law, before and after situation. All right, and that's what the rest of these slides are gonna propose. Just rearrange, and solve whichever one you want. I don't think we have to beat this horse too much. Um, but I will emphasize that when you have a problem like that, the first thing you should do before you do anything else. Well, after you put the values in our, in our list, in our table, convert the temperatures to Kelvin. Don't forget to do that. There we go. And we solve our problem just like any other. Now, your answer is going to come out in Kelvin. If the problem asks for Celsius, then you got to take the Kelvin and convert it back. Just subtract 273 from it and you get Celsius. Okay, the last law that we're going to discuss is Avogadro's law. 
Let's see. There we go. Avogadro. Avogadro's law is based upon the concept that you hold um, the pressure constant and the temperature constant, and you vary the number of moles in the confined space, what happens to the volume. So these two vary. As it turns out, it's a similar relationship to Charles. It's a quotient equal to a constant. So as you increase the number of moles, you increase the volume, as long as these two are constant. Now, Avogadro um, is kind of like Charles. He did the work, but he wasn't recognized for it until his student, Canizaro. Let's see, Can, Canizaro. I think that's the way you spell his name. Uh, took his work and started teaching chemistry differently. Up to this point, um, middle 19th century, all the chemists that were active in the industry and in the universities, most of them, were uh, basing all of their calculations, all their stoichiometries on mass. Mass of reactants gives mass of products. The problem with that is that's not how they work. We know from our balanced equations that when reactants come together, they come together in mole ratios, in numbers of atoms and molecules. But they didn't have a handle on how to go from mass to moles in those days. In fact, they all got together in, in Karlsruhe, uh, Bavaria, southern Germany, at a university there. And they all got together for this Congress and they said, we're going to figure this thing out because when our reactions go wonky, we can't fix them. We don't, uh, our, the methods we have don't work, right? And companies were losing money. So their, uh, their chemical engineers were desperate. So they went to this Congress and they, they butt their heads together for a week or two and just walked off and threw up their hands. <laughs> we can't figure it out. Well, fortunately, Canizaro was also at this Congress and he gave a little talk. And as they were leaving or the meeting, he was handing out reprints of his articles that he had written uh, using Avogadro's law. And that's when things started to turn for the good. In fact, um, Mendeleev, who's credited with being the father of the modern periodic table, gave Canizaro and Avogadro credit for um, leading him in the right direction to build his table. Now, what Avogadro said was, have I done this before? The two confined gases, I'll do it again, just so it'll be recorded. <laughs> So if you have a gas here and a gas here in this spherical container, say, then if the volume of the first one is equal to the volume of the second one, and the temperature of the first one is equal to the temperature of the second one, and the pressure inside is equal to the pressure inside the second one, all those are equal, then the number of moles of gas inside each one, the number of particles inside, it has to be exactly the same, okay? So that didn't get us very far until you weigh the gas in each one. Now the mass in this one may not be equal to the mass in that one. If that's the case, then we know why the masses are different because the number of particles are exactly the same. So if they're, they're the same, then the mass can only be due to the difference in the mass of each particle. So now they had a way to compare the masses of the particles. 
and they started to put together tables and, and data sets where you could relate the masses to the number of particles. And eventually that led to uh, molar masses. Now we had a way, a handle <clears throat> on, stoich on the true stoichiometry of chemical reactions based on Avogadro's law. So Avogadro's law, well, I wrote it up there before, but you can also say uh, volume and moles like that before and after, right, like that. And that device with a piston in it was, is a perfectly good way to measure the volume. All you need is a port so you can pump more gas into it. Okay, so let's not dwell too much on that because I want to simplify things. Believe it or not, it can be done. <laughs> oh, before we leave this topic, um, yeah, we're going to use as an example the decomposition of ammonia. So you heat ammonia up and you can get nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas out of that. Well, if we balance the equation, two moles of ammonia yields one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen. Okay. Now, if all of this is converted to all of that, what has changed? Two moles of this now make four moles of gas, one plus three. So you double the amount of gas in your container if you allow ammonia to decompose in your container. So when you do that, right, if we take two and make four out of it, what happens to the volume? If the pressure and the temperature are, are constant, the volume will double because you've doubled the number of moles. And that way we can measure what's actually happening in that reaction vessel. <laughs> so, if the volume starts out at 35 cubic feet and we allow the reaction to go to completion, we should have 70 cubic feet when the reaction is complete. Okay. Now let's, let's simplify things. We've got these three gas laws, but Maybe the situation doesn't behave. Maybe uh, not just two of them are very are variable, but maybe three or even four of them are variable. So what do you do then? Well, notice we've got this P1 V1 equals P2 V2 is Boyle's law. But we know the relationship between temperature and volume also. Okay. So that means the relationship between pressure and temperatures is also a direct relationship. But we also have uh, Avogadro's law. That's the combined gas law. So in order to use this, all you have to do is fill in uh, values for each of the variables and have one left over that's not known. Then you can solve it for that one. Okay, that's what all this uh, black print is saying. <laughs> okay, also remember that these relationships that's equal to a constant right there because that's equal to a constant, this is equal to a constant, those two are equal to a constant. So this whole thing is equal to a constant. Okay, um, so now I'm coming to the point where we're going to make a distinction between the type of problem you're facing. Is it a before and after problem? Are you given conditions before and then conditions after to solve a problem? If you are, then you can use that formula where you have this one equal to 
the subscript to. But if you don't, if you're in what I call a state situation, you only know where you are right now and you don't know how to get there, then you might be stuck. Except if we know the relationships here that give us a constant there, once we know the constant, then we don't need the rest of the equation. Right? So if we choose our units carefully, uh, pressure is one atmosphere, right? Vot is one mole of gas, and the temperature is standard. For gases, standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius, which is 273. Okay. Okay. We know those values. And then one mole of gas at one atmosphere and this temperature, we know what volume that it will produce. 22.4 liters. Now that we have those values, we can calculate what that is. And in fact, we give that a special R. But the units are important now. In other words, if you're going to solve it using this equation, your pressure always has to be in atmospheres, your volume in liters, moles, and temperature in K. And if we solve that equation, we get 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole K. Right? Liter atmospheres per mole K. Normally, you'll see this equation written this way. PV equals NR like that. Just rearrange it. Um, now, R can take many different forms depending on the units that are used. Uh, if we need R for a, an equation that has energy involved, like joules, then it'll be a different value here because the units are different. Right? And those different values are, are in the uh, review document, in the back of the review document useful information and, uh, in the middle uh, below densities let me show the peanut gallery here so in the useful information you can see these are different values for r depending on the values that are are in the equation that where r is located right. uh, we're going to use this one and we're going to use the second one, joules per mole K, 8.3145, those two. Okay. So this is the ideal gas equation. I sort of jumped ahead a few slides. What I need to do now to fill in the gaps is to define what we mean by an ideal gas. What is an ideal gas? Well, yeah, that's the short version. An ideal gas is a perfect gas. What do we mean by a perfect gas? Well, it remains a gas. It's always a gas, no matter what we do to it. At all pressures and all temperatures, it remains a gas. And the particles in the gas have point volume. Right? Remembering in a math class, you start off with a point. What are the dimensions of that point? None. It has no depth. It has no width. It has no height. That point represents no dimensions. <laughs> it's just a place in space. So we assume that the point molecular volume for the particles in a gas are a point. They have no volume. Now we know that's not true. Real gases have a volume. But this is an ideal gas. They do not interact with other gas molecules or particles inside the container. And of course they have to obey all the gas laws. That's an ideal gas. Now, real gases, we know that real gases can do, be liquefied and some can be solidified. Right? I used to use liquid argon 
for one of my uh, analytical instruments. And uh, we, would, uh, we would use uh, liquid nitrogen to flee freeze plant material. Um, or sometimes we used uh, dry ice, which is solid carbon dioxide. So we know that real gases um, do condense into liquids and solids under the right conditions. They do actually have volume. And they do interact with one another. Some have a very little interaction. Some have a lot of interaction. And since they have volume, they also have mass, and they interact with the walls of the container. In other words, they bounce off the walls. If they didn't do that, we couldn't measure the pressure, right? Because you stick a gauge in there, right? You stick a gauge in here, there's a gas on this side. And you put a gauge in there. How are you going to measure the pressure if the gas doesn't bang on the diaphragm, right? It doesn't work. So we know that real gases interact with the container. Now, fortunately, most gases behave ideally. They act like an ideal gas under certain conditions. And those conditions are high temperature, low pressure, and low moles. That's not in there. But that's also true. Low moles, low pressure, high temperature. A gas will behave ideally. Now, what do we mean by low pressure? One atmosphere pressure is low pressure. Uh, even 10 atmospheres can be treated as low pressure. High temperature, relative to what? Well, relative to absolute zero, room temperature. It's a, uh, let's see. Are we still recording? I sure hope we are. Because I didn't pause it. Zero uh, K, relative to zero K, room temperature is 293 degrees C. So that's high temperature. Okay. And low moles, obviously. Uh, one mole in a container is considered low moles. Okay. So those conditions are met for most of what we're going to be doing now if you're a if you're a chemical engineer and you have to run a reaction at at 250 atmospheres and uh, uh 1500 degrees celsius then right you've got to uh, make some adjustments and the last slide in this set will show you what those adjustments are not that you'll ever have to use them i'm just making a point so there's your ideal gas equation coming up, where you combine all three, and the ideal gas equation works for a state. Where are you right now? It doesn't matter how you got there. Actually, it was first proposed by Emil Clapeyron, and we'll see Clapeyron again later. He was active in a number of different fields. So there's the ideal gas equation, and those are the two main constants that we're going to be using. Um, so you have to pay attention to the units of measure. That will tell you which constant you can use. And in the, any equation that has R in it, and R is reserved for the gas constant, any equation that has R in it, look at the units of measure for the other variables, and that'll tell you which one of the R's you need to use. All right. <clears throat> so this is just multiple ways to solve the equation. It's interesting. Um, sometimes you can combine uh, equations. Uh, I don't know if you did this in math class, but you can say if you have uh, um, uh, X equals, well, let's, let's say, y equals 3x and uh, uh, b 
equals a uh, plus y. Then if y is equal to 3x, we can substitute for that 3x. And some chemistry problems you can solve that way by combining equations. Well, I'll point those out when we get to them. Uh, one of our labs, we do that. Okay, just different ways of rearrange. You can also rearrange for ratios. Here we go. Moles per volume or volume per moles. You can solve for that ratio. Come on. There we go. N divided by V is equal to pressure over RT. Moles per unit volume. And there's your R. So you can solve for R also. Okay. I better, I better kick it up a little bit. So here's a system. Calculate the pressure of a system when two moles of gas at 37 degrees C occupies a volume of 50 liters. This is a state function because you only have one value each for the variables. You don't have a before and after situation. So that tells you that you need to use the ideal gas equation. You need to rearrange for pressure. And then when you substitute your values, be sure that your values are in the proper units. Moles correct. Degrees C converted to Kelvin. Liters, that's the volume unit. Okay, and then we find that pressure is 1.018 atmospheres. Um, here's one where you have a negative degrees Celsius, right? We can't plug that into the equation. So this is obvious to convert it to Kelvin. But we also have to convert millimeters of mercury to atmospheres, right? That's a non-standard term, convert it. That's a non-standard term, convert it. to atmospheres. Now we can use the equation because volume is already in liters. Right? We can find out how many moles of gas are there under those conditions. Okay. This is very useful when we are doing stoichiometry with uh, a reaction that involves gases because um, it's difficult to measure moles of a gas, or moles of anything, actually. We would measure mass if it were a solid. Uh, we might measure, uh, if it's in solution, we may have a concentration that we use to get moles. Uh, if it's a gas, we can solve, it, and we have the right uh, parameters, we can solve for moles for the gas. And then, uh, if you know moles, you can move anywhere in an equation. Okay, here's an example. Um, mercury 2 oxide, solid. Uh, it's kind of a reddish color. Uh, Antoine Lavoisier used this. Uh, he, he, he put that stuff, uh, mercury 2 oxide, in a bell jar and then got a magnifying glass and shined light on it and caused it to decompose. And the products were uh, liquid mercury and oxygen gas. Well, he wanted to know what that oxygen gas was because he could, he could see it evolving in there. So he put live animals in there with it <laughs> and he found that they survived. So the, whatever the gas was, was, was good for them. And they had their terminology in those days that has passed on into history. But under these conditions, uh, Calculate the mass of mercury 2 oxide needed to produce 220 cubic centimeters of oxygen, right? We have to convert the cubic centimeters to liters. Remember, a cubic centimeter is the same as a milliliter. So if 220 milliliters is 0 0.220 liters. Then you convert the temperature, you convert the pressure, and now we can use the ideal gas equation to find out how many moles of oxygen we're talking about. That equation will tell us the number of moles. Oops, I went too far. 
There we go. Number of moles of oxygen. Now that we know the number of moles of oxygen, we can um, use the coefficients to ratio and give us the moles of uh, mercury to oxide. And then since we know the formula for mercury to oxide, we can find the mass. And that's what we're doing here. Oops. There we go. 1.8693 grams of mercury two oxide will give us 220 cubic centimeters of oxygen under those conditions of temperature and pressure. All right. Now what's the volume of the mercury left over? Well, you can find out the moles of, of mercury liquid from our conversion. Since we know the moles of oxygen, and then convert that into mass and then use the density of mercury to determine its volume. And that's what we're doing step by step. So there we have. It. It's not much mercury, right? right. Uh, 0 0.258 cubic centimeters, just a little bit. Okay. Uh, this method that I'm going to describe, the Duma method, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it right now because later on we do a lab using the Duma method. <clears throat> and this, this Duma is not the same one that wrote um, Three Musketeers. It's a different Duma. So, uh, in short, what you do, you look at... Um, remember when we were doing um, uh, empirical formulas? and then molecular formulas. In order to go from empirical to molecular, you had to know the actual molar mass of the compound. This is one way to get the molar mass. If you have a compound that is volatile, and all you have to do is heat it up a little bit, and turn it into a gas, then you can use that and the gas law to find out how many moles are associated with that mass of the gas. And then, right, molecular weight or molar mass is equal to the mass per mole, right? So all you need to know is the mass and the moles of that gas. And uh, uh, when we get, when we, uh, when I give you that lab, the Dumas method that we're going to use, I think it's the last one of, this, of the year, then we'll go into more detail and explaining uh, how that works. But here's a, here's a way, here's one where we combine equations. Uh, let's see. This is the equation for uh, molar mass, molecular weight. And then we have PV equals NRT for the, the gas law. So if we solve this one for moles, moles equals mass divided by molecular weight, then we can substitute this right here and solve for molecular weight. And when we do that, we get a new equation. There we go. All we need to know is the mass of the gas, our gas constant, the temperature of the gas, the pressure it's under, and the volume. And we can calculate the molar mass of that compound. Okay, this is an example. This is the solution to that problem that's given to you. And we determined that that uh, compound is 152.98 grams per mole. So that's one way. There are a host of different ways. The nice thing about using this is um, all gases behave alike. So you don't have to know anything about the compound to find out what it's molar mass is. Okay. Um, let's see. Sometimes the ideal gas law is used in a dynamic condition. Mm. Well, this is a before and after situation, isn't it? Notice you, you, have, you start off with one temperature, you end up at a different temperature, 
Start off at one pressure, end up at a different pressure. Start off at one volume, and we want to know the final volume. So that's a before and after condition. You don't even have to, you don't need the ideal gas law for this one. You need the combined gas law. So there's the combined gas law. And it's equal to, initial is equal to final conditions. There we go. Rearrange it. We want to know the final volume. Well, notice you've got moles in there, final and initial. Well, have the moles changed? No, there was no chemical reaction in there. We didn't add moles. We didn't subtract any moles. So you can cancel out the moles. Right? And that's what we're going to do right there. See, they gray out. Now you can solve it for the final volume. 23.75 liters. And that's an error. Small L is not liters. Big L is liters. I need to fix that. Okay. Uh, I think this is another example. In this case, the moles do change. We know before and after conditions. We know uh, volume before and after. And we're looking for the final pressure of the system. Right? So in this case, we do have a change in the number of moles. So when we set up this equation and we solve for the final pressure, we need to know how many moles final versus how many moles initial. And we've looked at this equation before. We know that the final moles are four and the initial moles are two. So we can put those values in there along with the rest of them and find out the final pressure is going to be 1,728 millimeters of mercury. So the pressure went way up from initial pressure of 400 millimeters of mercury. Okay, one more law, and then we'll talk about the theory behind all this. Dalton, John Dalton, who, who proposed the atomic theory, right, the original atomic theory. He also worked with gases. Dalton's law of partial pressure simply says that when you measure the pressure the total pressure of a mixture of gases. That total pressure is actually a, an arithmetic combination, a summation of the individual pressures of each of the gases that are in that mixture. And you can go on out to however many it takes. Doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't just stop there because we know that these pressures are due to, uh, if all these conditions are the same, if these are the, if that's the same, that's the same, that's the same for each one of them, then the difference in the pressure is due to the number of moles of gas. So this is where we can relate. Notice that what we've done is we've solved PV equals NRT for pressure, NRT over V. So you can substitute that for each one of these. And that's what we've done in that first equation, right? The number of moles is the only thing that's different among those. R is constant, temperature is constant, volume is constant. So what we notice is that the total number of moles is equal to the summation of the individual moles of the gas. There we go. So this Dalton's law is a reflection of the number of moles of each one of those gases. That's all we're saying. Okay, so we do a little fancy footwork. And what you'll also notice is that um, the total number of moles is equal to the summation of the individual moles. And I'm going to stop at three for this one. <clears throat> but we can also say we divide through by the total number of moles. Right? The whole thing. Okay. 
There we go. Now, we know this is equal to 1, right? This, each one of these, is a new term called mole fraction. And it is a fraction. And if you add all these fractions up, you get 1. So the mole fraction of a gas in a mixture is responsible for the pressure of each one of these. Okay, that's what we're saying there, and it's really, it is that simple. Okay, so here's an example. This chemical reaction. Consider the balanced detonation reaction. <laughs> so that should be a clue. If we're going to say it's detonated, then that must be right there. That must be explosive. And in fact, that's the chemical formula for nitroglycerin. So when we balance the equation, and they're all gases, we go from four moles of gas to 12 plus 10 plus 6 plus 1 is 29 moles. So we go from 4 to 29 moles, plus we release a lot of heat. Right? So that's where the explosive force comes, a combination of heat and a rapid, massive increase in the number of moles of gas, which increases the pressure. Okay, so if we have these conditions, uh, a 100 liter vessel at 25 degrees and 20 millimeters of mercury pressure, so we've partially evacuated it, and we detonate, um, let's see how much. Am I covering something up there? Let me see. No. We detonate that gas. Oh, we don't need to know the mass because we've got the conditions. We detonate that gas and it expands to 110 liters and the temperature rises to 400 degrees Celsius. The question is, what's the pressure now? And all we have to do is be sure that our units are correct. And we use the rearranged equation. Now we know what the moles are. The initial moles are four, final moles are 29. So we put those values in, and we find out that we've gone from we've gone from 20 millimeters of mercury to almost 300. So it's almost 15 times the pressure. Okay. Um, calculating the partial pressure of each one of the gases, you just need to know the mole fraction. And since we have the balanced equation, the mole fraction of um, carbon dioxide is 12 divided by 29, because that's the total number of moles. And you can multiply that times the total pressure and find the partial pressure of each one of the gases. Let's do that all the way down. Add them up, and they should be equal to the pressure that was originally determined. Close. Okay. Um, another way to use Dalton's law of partial pressure in a practical way is sometimes experiments we conduct in the lab, we, the experiment generates a gas. So we have a reaction vessel. I think I need to get rid of that. We get a fresh one. Here we go. We have a reaction vessel. And we want to trap, we want to catch the gas. Right? So we have a vat of water here. Like this. And we have a, a, a measuring device here, uh, graduated probably, and the bubbles come out here and they displace the water. We filled it up with water first and then we inverted it. And now we can measure the volume of the gas. We know the temperature 
Uh, we know the pressure because we, we measure the atmospheric pressure that's bearing down on it. And we can calculate how many moles, uh, or we can calculate the, the pressure inside here. But the pressure is due to two things. It's due to the pressure of the gas, and it's due to the pressure of water. Because at a certain temperature, water vapor will be <laughs> produced in that space too. So what we need to do is find a way, um, and there are charts that say at a given temperature, the pressure of water vapor in the, the headspace will be a certain value. So if we know the temperature of, the, of what's in there, say 20 degrees C, we can say, okay, the, the pressure that's due to water is this subtracted from the total, and you have your, the pressure of your trapped gas. Okay, now we need a theory to explain all this stuff. It's called the kinetic molecular theory. Originally developed for gases, but it has since been expanded to other phases as well. So, it's a very simple model. There's some basic postulates. Large numbers of particles called atoms or molecules are involved. And the reason we need large numbers is, is well, one thing, when you have even that much gas, there's lots of particles in there. <clears throat> but we need large numbers because we have to treat this gas uh, from a statistical standpoint. Because we cannot measure individual behaviors, individual momenta for each of the particles. So we treat them as a, as a mass. Large numbers of particles. They're very small compared to the distance between them. Right? So they're they're their volume is, is almost equivalent to point volume. They're in rapid motion. In fact, very rapid motion. <clears throat> and when they collide with one another, which they will do, there uh, are no interactions among the particles. But they do collide with one another and they their collisions are perfectly elastic. I know it doesn't say that there, but that's what we mean. They're like billiard balls. They just bounce off each other. But they also collide with the walls of the container. That's the kinetic part. The molecules, there are lots of molecules in there, and the kinetic part is they're moving and they bang into stuff. And all the gas molecules have the same average kinetic energy as long as they're at the same temperature. So any gas at a given temperature has the same average kinetic energy in that mass of gas. So what we're saying is temperature is a way of measuring the average kinetic energy of all the particles in the gas. And we, of course, we have to assume that there are no intermolecular forces. And I said that before, they're like billiard balls. They just bounce off each other. Okay, there's a, there's a problem. If we want to say anything about the velocity of these particles, we can't use an arithmetic mean. If we were able to measure the velocity of every particle in the gas and then take the mean of that, uh, then that mean velocity, if we used it in, in this equation, would give us an average energy, but it won't. Because that mean velocity uh, does not represent the, the correct velocity for the molecules. And this little uh, thought problem demonstrates that. We use seven balls that are five kilograms each, and that's probably a bowling ball. And they're each moving at different velocities, right? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 meters per second. 
and we can calculate the energy of each one of those in terms of joules. We just use this formula, and it gives us their energy in joules. Okay. Um, so what's the average speed? I just add them up and divide by seven. It's 40 meters per second. Right, that's the average, the arithmetic average of the velocities for those seven balls. So what if we take the average of the kinetic energies, though? Take the average of the kinetic energies, you get 5,000 joules is the average kinetic energy for those seven balls. Well, if we rearrange the equation, this equation, and solve it for velocity, and plug the average energy in there, in here, Yeah, the average energy here and the mass, which would be five kilograms for each one of them, then what would be the, the velocity that that ball would have to be traveling to give you that average uh, energy, 5,000 joules. Okay, so we plug those values in and we find out that it's, excuse me, 44.72 meters. That's not 40 meters per second. Right? It's more. Right? So what we need is another way to calculate the velocity so that we can actually derive, using this formula, an average kinetic energy. And as it turns out, it's not the arithmetic mean. It's a term called RMS, root mean square. So how do we get the root mean square? Well, you work backwards. Square. Square each of the values of the velocity. All right, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70, right? Square each one. 100, 400, 900, 1600, 2500, 3,600 and 4,900 joules. Okay, those are the squares. So this is the velocity, this is the velocity squared. Squared. Now take the mean of that. So the mean of this is equal to something. Let's see, let's do that. What's the mean of, of those squared velocities? 100 plus 400 plus 900. Plus 1600, 2500, oops, there, uh, plus 3600, and plus 4900. So that's 11,500 and some change. But we're going to take the, the average of that, so we divide by seven. So I get one, six, four, three meters per second squared, right? Because this is these are squared values. Now, we squared them, we took the mean of them, now we take the root. We take the square root of this to get rid of those squared values. Let's see, where's my square root? Yeah, I did something wrong. That's not the right value. <laughs> I punched the wrong button. What it should come out to is the root mean square is equal to 44.72 meters per second. So the root mean square of the velocities gives us the correct velocity to use in our kinetic energy equation. Now, what people don't realize is you use root mean square every day. If you plug something into that wall socket, that's alternating current. In other words, the voltage in that line goes positive for half a cycle, uh, and it may reach up to, um, uh, let's see, 
150 or 60 volts, and then it goes down through zero and back down negative. Well, you can't very well use one of those values to do any calculating or, or uh, uh, designing equipment that would work. So you need a value that represents those varying voltages, and that's the root mean square. The root mean square of those voltages is 110 volts. That's the DC equivalent, so to speak. Okay. Um, so, what can we do with this information? Well, if we look at each individual particle and try to determine its energy, we have to look at it in three dimensions, right? What's its energy in the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction? If we're just talking about one particle. A kinetic energy of a mole of those particles would be the one mole times it. So the root mean square velocity is that's the mathematical representation. Mu is equal to the velocity. Right? But you would have to do that for each one of those directions. Okay. We've set all that to boil it down to a single equation that's useful for chemists. The root mean square velocity for a molecule is based upon the uh, gas constant, the temperature, and its molar mass. So that equation gives you the uh, root mean square velocity for any one. But we got to make sure that the units uh, match. That's the, that's the kicker. And we need a different R value. So we're going to use an R value here that has joules in it. But not just, not just the joules, because when we solve the equation, if we use it to solve a problem, and we still have joules in it, it may not work out to the right velocity. So what we have to do is say, what is the equivalent of a joule? Where does the joule come from? Well, the joule is a unit of energy, right? So mass, the standard unit for mass is kilogram. Velocity is meters per second, so we square them. So one joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Now, if we substitute that in here, then we can put it in the equation and end up with meters per second. And that's what we're going to do with air. We're going to say, what's the average velocity, the root mean square velocity of air? at 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, we need an average molar mass for air and we do a weighted average, primarily nitrogen and oxygen, and we come up with 29.02 grams per mole. Okay. Now, that's a lot. <laughs> there you have your R constant with this substitution in it. Okay, we need that so that items will cancel. We also need to convert the molar mass to units of kilograms per mole rather than grams per mole. And that's what we've done in the denominator under the, under the uh, square root sign. Now we just have to cancel, cancel our units and do the math. And we find out that that average velocity, the root mean square velocity, is 500 meters per second. Well, that doesn't mean much to, to uh, uh, U.S. ears. We need it in miles per hour or feet per second, right? 1,100 miles per hour, that's definitely greater than the speed of sound. 
What if we had helium in there instead? Well, notice that if, if helium is in there, then the denominator becomes smaller. That means the value will increase. And in fact, it, it more than doubles. Right, so the smaller molecule to have the same energy has to travel faster. And that's, that's intuitive. Okay, this one last discussion. It's called Graham's Law of Diffusion, or Graham's Law of Effusion. Yeah, I think we got just enough time. With an H in it, yeah. Graham's Law of Effusion. Okay, we're gonna use that formula that we just proposed, and Graham's law get, can be used in several different ways. One way is to determine the molar mass of an unknown. All right, so here's another way. We talked about Dumas method. Now this Graham's law can give us another method to get a handle on the molar mass of an unknown gas. So first we ratio one gas to the other velocity. And then we substitute in there. Um, well, we're gonna multiply both of them by a unit of time, right? So if we have velocity times time equals distance. So how far will the gas travel in a certain amount of time? Well, depends on their velocities. So we need to have a handle on what's the velocity. Well, for gas A, the velocity is 3RT over the molar mass. And for gas B, it's the same thing except for the molar mass of B. Well, notice that 3 cancels, R cancels, and T cancels because everything's happening at the same temperature. So if we do that and then rearrange the equation, now we get the ratio of the velocity of one to the other is actually the square root of the velocity of the other to the one. <laughs> it's inverse. And we can use that to determine if we know the molar mass of one of them, we don't know the molar mass of the other one. All we have to do is measure their relative velocities or the relative distance that they move. So we need a way to do that. And one way is uh, demonstrated with these two gases, ammonia and hydrogen chloride, right? So you put hydrochloric acid, drip it into a, um, a ball of uh, glass wool, and do the same thing with ammonia, and you shove them in the ends of a glass tube. And then you uh, wait for them to uh, diffuse down the length of the tube and meet somewhere. And then you measure the ratio of the distances. And remember on that previous slide, the ratio of the distance of A to B is related to that square root uh, expression. And the reason we can use it is because ammonium chloride is a solid. So when they meet, they make kind of a fog. And you can tell exactly where they meet. Okay. So there's our equation. Now, we happen to know the molar mass of each one of these, right? So if we plug those values in, we can find out what's the ratio of the distance that ammonia traveled to the distance that um, hydrogen chloride traveled. And that turns out to be, the ratio is 1.463. So what does that mean? That means that hydrogen chloride travels faster than ammonia. Oh, excuse me. No, it, uh, yeah, hydrogen chloride travels. No, ammonia travels a greater distance than hydrogen chloride. Okay, you probably saw that coming, didn't you? Okay. Right, so the distance ammonia travels is greater than the distance that hydrogen chloride travels. And if we know that the um, 
the length of the tube is 150 centimeters, then we can, we can tell where they're going to meet. Right? So the distance uh, that HCL travels is 60.9 centimeters, and then what's left over is 89.1 centimeters. That's the distance that ammonia travels. And we can work backwards from that. If we have an unknown gas, then all we need is a gas that we know. There you go, they form in the middle. So let's say we have an unknown gas with ammonia, and we've already demonstrated qualitatively that they will, when they react, they give us a, a, a clear fog, so to speak. And under those conditions, we put those two gases in the end of that tube, and we watch how far they move. What's the ratio of the distance? Right. So we find that the ratio is 2.738. Now we know that ammonia is 17 point some odd grams per mole, but we don't know the molar mass of the other one. Right. So we have an equation in one unknown now. And we can solve that unknown. There we go. 127.6 grams per mole. Now, if we have something to choose from, like these uh, halogens, uh, then we can match up which one it is. It turns out to be uh, hydrogen iodide. Okay. One last, well, actually, there are two last things. I'll try to make this one quick. <clears throat> As a kid growing up, I lived in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Oak Ridge, Tennessee was, um, during World War II, and for many years afterwards, it was a, a center of research in nuclear physics. And one of the things that was done there, at Oak Ridge at that time had the highest per capita population of PhD chemists and engineers. <clears throat> uh, it was because they were trying to uh, separate, to uh, enrich uranium. Uranium occurs in basically two isotopes. Well, more than two, but these are the ones that we're interested in. 235 and 238. This is the one you can use to make a bomb. And it's only about 0.7%, right? Because you got to find a way to enrich it. Well, the way, one of the ways that, um, and there were three huge uh, research facilities and, and plants there, and each one had its own way of doing it. One of them used Graham's Law of Effusion. And if you turn this into a gas, it's, it's hard to do because that's a metal. But if you turn it into a fluoride, now it'll turn into a gas at a lower temperature. And you take it and under high pressure, you drive it through a sieve, something with a very tiny holes. Well, which one's going to go faster through the holes? That one. So on the other side of that sieve, it's slightly enriched in U-235. So you take it and you keep pushing it through sieves, one after the other, thousands of them. And eventually you get to over 90%. And then you reconvert it back into uranium metal and, and turn it into a bomb or actually at lower percentage enrichment, you can turn it into civilian nuclear power. But uh, let's see, I think I got a picture of the plant. It was called, and notice that the, um, that the root mean square velocity ratio of these two is very small. 1.0043, right? So that's not a big difference. That's why you have to have, you have to go through so many filters. And this plant was K25, right? That's like 40 something acres. Hold on a second. Uh, it's missing some information. It's like 44 acres for that whole plant. And it was surrounded by chain link fence with barbed wire on the top and guard dogs and, and guards with uh, 
orders to shoot first and ask questions later. <clears throat> but there was a service road that ran around it. And uh, my family wasn't that rich. So for entertainment, we'd hop in the car and we'd drive around the plant. <laughs> Take about 15 or 20 minutes. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the, the key to making this work was the right kind of material for the sieve, the filter. Because if you use stainless steel, this uranium fluoride would eat it up. It would not last. Fortunately, just a few years before, back in the late 30s, uh, DuPont came up with a material called Teflon. And they made their filters out of Teflon, it worked perfect. Um, and they just had, but most of that building is occupied with filters. <laughs> and they just, um, it worked. Now it wasn't the most efficient way, but it did work. Nowadays they use ultra centrifuges. They're more efficient. And they, in fact, that's what Iran is doing now. They're enriching their uranium to make bombs and try to, blow Israel up. Okay, now the last slide is, what do we do when the gas uh, is, is high pressure and low temperature and lots of molds, right? It doesn't behave ideally anymore. So you need a way, and I'm gonna skip through these because they're, you need a way to compensate, right? You need fudge factors. Right, and um, this fellow right here, uh, Van der Waals, uh, won a, a Nobel Prize in 1910 for his work on the gases. And he proposed the correction factor here for it. This is the pressure term, this is the volume term. Didn't have to worry about these. So the pressure term needed this, this fudge factor, the number of moles, the volume, and this has to be empirically determined for, for every gas, as does this B value times the number of moles and subtracted from volume. And if you do that, then the real gas behaves as if it were ideal. And that should be the last slide.